Yesterday, Sierraji spoke about the fifth cause for the five ruling faculties to become sharp. Samadesa cha nimeta gahena. And he spoke about this in terms of theory and practice. He spoke in a way that was neither brief nor in great detail. And the yogis who listen carefully should understand clearly the meaning of what was said. Today, he will talk about the sixth cause for the five ruling faculties to be sharp. Whether it's due to faith or due to desire to gain something, or whether it's just as an experiment. Once one has started a task, one can't gain the benefits uh, for nothing. So one has to study what needs to be done with respect and care and continuity. And then one, one will gain good practice if one works in this way. And one will come to know the true Dhamma. So when we, when we receive something, if someone gives us something, if the recipient doesn't receive it in a respectful way, or if they don't use what is received appropriately, then it's not worth giving the gift. So it's very important for the recipients to use the gift respectfully, to to receive the gift respectfully, and to use it. In the Buddha's teaching, in Buddha Sasana, there are three things. And the first, bodhi. Bodhi is the most important. And this means knowing or knowledge. So what is what is known, what is to be known? The truth of suffering the truth of the cause, the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the cessation, the dying down of suffering, the truth of the path that leads to the dying down, cessation of suffering. These four things. And to know these four is very important. So the method to know the truth of suffering, to be able to discern it. And because one doesn't observe this truth of suffering at the moment of arising, then the cause for suffering arises. So there's a method for eliminating the cause. And how the truth of how the how suffering and its cause cease, how suffering ceases, one doesn't know at first. And then then there's the path leading to the cessation. So this is the true Dhamma. And the first two of these four truths are the worldly truths. The second two are the supra-mundane truths, the truths that are beyond the world. The worldly truths are evident in one's being, and so we need to research these, we need to study these. The remaining two truths have not yet arisen in us, and so 
There's no need to try to study them. Among the four truths, the worldly truths are to be known and to be dispelled. The remaining two, we just need to understand what their qualities are. This is what the texts say, and this is natural. In order to know, first of all, there must, must be ogaha. That means that one has to uh, hear about, in brief, these are the Four Noble Truths. There's the truth of suffering, the truth of its cause, the truth of its cessation, and the truth of the path leading to it. So that's first. And then there, there's paripocha, which means to discuss. If one doesn't know about these, then one discusses with the teacher. And giving the Dhamma talks is in the nature of ogaha, ogaha and paripocha. So it's giving the method in brief. And so is the interview with the teacher. The teacher gives the method in summary, and then there's discussion and a chance to ask questions. So these, this, at first, this is very important. The worldly truths, the two worldly truths, are profound and hard to see. So they are hard to see, and in detail, at first, uh, it is hard to see the truth of suffering and it is hard to see h how taking pleasure in, in this, taking pleasure in suffering. It is difficult to see the cause of suffering. These truths are profound and hard to see. They are hard to see because they are profound, and the remaining two are hard to see. Therefore, they are profound. So the, when the first two truths are accomplished, then the remaining two truths will automatically be known. So one follows the correct path, and at the uh, at the end of the path, one comes to the end of Nama and Rupa, the cessation of Nama and Rupa, and realization of Nibbana. And uh, one, it is important to know, it is enough to know the qualities of these two second truths. Though to know the first truth to know the truth of suffering. So how to know it? One has to listen to the method. This is called savana. So to know the truth of suffering, observe at the very moment of arising. When there's bending, stretching, lifting, moving, placing, opening and closing the eyes, these are all the truth of suffering. And to see their cause, one doesn't know or one knows wrongly, and then one takes pleasure, one craves. So one has to understand. And one has to observe every arising. So every, every time there's an occurrence, every time something occurs, one has to observe it. And how, how one should do this is at the moment of arising, not after something has already happened, because then it is in the past, and not before, because then it's just something we imagine. 
It has to be observed while, while it happens. So, and Sierrauchi is saying this because he wants people to listen uh, to effectively to the talk that he is going to give about the factors of enlightenment, which is the topic for tonight. So then, following listen to the method, one has to retain it, dharana, one has to remember it. And if one listens to the sound, but then doesn't remember it, then one won't know what is the correct method for knowing the truth of suffering and dispelling its cause. So uh, if one just pushes aside what is being said, thinking he's talking about this all the time, why is he talking again and again about this? One can't do that. So it's very important to receive the gift with respect and use it. So one has to res- listen with respect to the Dhamma talk. Uh, this is called sadukang savana. And because of that, then we can remember dharana. And following listening and remembering one has to uh, do what is samasana and that means to really connect with what has been said and to take it to heart and in in Burmese the word that they use for samasana means to rub it to rub something but if you think about it when you rub something then you know the quality. You know whether it's hard. You know whether it's soft. You know whether it's coarse. So in in English, I think, take take something to heart. But this quality of rubbing against the object is part of, involves a jhanic factor. So one has to observe every arising object effectively not carelessly. This is the yogi's job to be done every second of the time, second after second. And one should consider if we do this or not. It's not just a matter of sitting, not just observing while we sit. At the end of the sitting, then there's stiffness in the legs, aches, and there's the desire to relieve this aching. And because of the desire, one moves one's legs. One supports oneself with one's hand. And applying effort, one observes that. Then one knows what is happening there. Then the attention goes to the legs as one comes up gradually, inch by inch. And if one observes inch by inch this process of standing up, then one will know what is happening. And when one needs to use one's hands for balance, one will know how that feels. And then when the body is finally upright, one will feel the whole standing. So one has to try to note effectively. That means to apply ardent effort to what is arising and aim accurately so that the mind will be able to connect with the object and have this quality of rubbing against the object. And once one has stood up, then one wants to go. One wants to walk. So there's the wanting to walk and then the observation of each step one makes. So the yogis listen to the method and then they know it. And then they should try to apply it. Every, every object that arises, they should try to make their mind rub, connect with the object 
effectively. This is very important. Like this, if one observes effectively, starting with even small objects, if one applies effort, ardent effort and accurate aim, most of the time, a lot of the time, many times, then every time the mind falls collectively on the object, one will know its true nature. So whether falling on hardness, one will know the hardness. When the mind falls on something soft, one will know the softness. When the mind falls on something coarse, one will know the coarseness. Where something hard and solid, one will know that. Or something soft and flowing, one will know that. One will know thinking, one will know knowing, contact, feeling. All these are true nature. And when one rubs against these qualities a lot, there will be pativeda, which is penetrative knowledge. This is knowledge that does not arise because we read about it or because we heard about it or discussed it. This is knowledge that comes because of our own direct observation. And this knowledge starts out being immature, but it, it grows to become mature. It starts out small and it becomes large and it expands. So this is what Pativeda is, uh, no, penetrating and knowing. So there's savana, listening, dharana, remembering, samasana, taking it to heart, applying it, and pativeda, coming to know penetrate in a penetrative way. So one reaches that point, and this is not knowledge that is due to reflection or thinking about things. The thing that is known in this way through Pativeda, every arising, is it's known from all sides. It's known completely. And this is indicated by the prefix sem. So this is called sambodhi, knowing in a complete way. This is not knowledge that arise through hearing, sutta miyanyana. Not, it's not theoretical knowledge. It's not reflective knowledge, chinta miyanyana. It's not knowledge that arises because we heard it from somebody else. It is a complete knowledge of our own. And what is known is that whatever arises is the truth of suffering. Sambodhi, one's own knowledge. If this Sambodhi knows the truth of suffering, If it doesn't, if there's not knowledge of the truth of suffering, then one clings. So one doesn't know what is really there, and one clings to it. One becomes attached, one craves and clings. When we think something is good, then we become quite attached to it. And so when one encounters something one likes, one clings to that. Yes, this is, cra- this is craving, the truth of suffering. And if one, sorry, the truth of the cause of suffering. And if, um, if one encounters with suffering on difficult situations, one also craves because one wants to be rid of them. So cra- this can also be the cause for craving, craving to arise. And when things are 
uh, neutral also, one also likes this situation. So it, it, these, in, in these ways craving can arise, tanna. But whenever something arises, if we observe it, and if we then know the truth of suffering, because of this knowing, not knowing is dispelled. Because of this knowing, knowing in the wrong way is dispelled. And there will be no craving, no tanna. So if one, if tanha arises, when, when we don't observe, this will, this will arise. And then on top of craving for something, there will be the thought that this is I, the view of self. And on the other hand, if one observes and knows, these will be dispelled, the craving and, the, and this view of I. So that's why it is said in the text that by knowing the truth of suffering, its cause is dispelled. Its cause is dispelled in that we don't give it a chance to arise. So similarly, um, if, some, if someone is already sitting in a chair, if one person gets there first, and sits down in a chair, then another person can't come to that chair and sit down. There's already somebody there. And in the same way, uh, when knowledge arises for the object that we are observing, then not knowing cannot take place. Not knowing. And knowing in the wrong way also. There's no chance for that to come. There's no chance for craving to arise, tanna. There's no chance for clinging, upadana, to arise. And there's no chance for, uh, in connection with craving and clinging, there's no, con no chance for wrong belief to arise. So none of these things can come when knowledge is there. These are eliminated. At this moment, if we analyze the components, if we analyze what is happening, it's analogous to when light enters, then darkness is eliminated. When one knows the true Dhamma, when no, one knows what is really there, then avijja, not knowing ignorance is is uh, is ended it comes to an end and also knowing in the wrong way it ceases it comes to an end craving which occurs because one doesn't know this also comes to an end and also clinging the advanced form of craving this also comes to an end. So this, these three, avijja, tanha, upadana, ignorance, craving, and clinging, these are the cycle of kilesas. And this comes to an end. This is niroda, or cessation. At the start, when we're st uh, starting our observation, it's ignorance that is dying down. And this is uh, called temporary, sorry, Tadanga Niroda. This is, um, could be translated as momentary uh, cessation. So in the first part, this is the cessation of avijja. When knowledge arises on the object, then there's this Tadanga Niroda. At this moment, the ordinary type of wholesomeness which causes us to have new lifetimes, which causes existence, this can't arise. 
and only um, the only type of kusala that can arise at this moment where the kilesas are, are subsiding, are being eliminated, is the type of wholesomeness that brings an end to our samsaric existence. No unwholesomeness at all can arise at this moment. So the, the, the type of kusala which causes us to have good existences and also the, type, the un, akusala, unwholesomeness, which causes bad existences, both of these die down. And in that way, the cycle of kama has ended. And because the cycle of kama ends, the cycle of results also, vipaka vata, comes to an end. Because of knowledge, kilesas, the, the cycle of kilesas, kilesa vata, the cycle of kama, actions, uh, the, um, comes to an end, and the cycle of results, vipaka, vipaka vutta. These all come to an end because of the moment of knowing. And this is called tadanga niroda, or, uh, or temporary cessation, momentary cessation. So we are trying to get a lot of this tadanga niroda. We want to get a lot of this because if we do, then eventually we will get to this achanta niroda, this lasting cessation. To overcome the enemy can't be done with just one soldier. So we need an army. And let's look at what is involved in this army. There's three groups. The group of sila, the group of samadhi, and the group of panya. So the group of sila is what overcomes the gross misdeeds. One avoids these. And the lay people, the lay people here take eight precepts. The monks have their vinya, and this is what we take at the start. Every moment of observation, there are, uh, there are also factors present. We should look and see what they are. When one observes every arising object, starting with the rising and the falling. First of all, there's art and effort to get the mind to the object. This is one soldier that has to be present. He must be there. And this art and effort overcomes extreme laziness and other kilesas, and it opens the path for other wholesomeness, other kusala to come in. Sati follows effort, and this protects the mind so that it is secure. When sati is continuous, then raga, dosa, and moha, greed, hatred, and delusion, can't enter the mind. These are blocked out, kept away by sati, and because of sati, the mind falls collectively on the object. It's unified. It doesn't go elsewhere. So then the akusala cannot come in. So the kulesas are overcome in every moment of observation. They can't arise. So this is the a group of samadhi, samadhi maganga, maganga, the path factors of samadhi. And then we also apply accurate aim to observe the object. This is called in Pali sama sankapa. Because of accurate aim, the mind rubs against the object, and this is the quality of vichara, 
but it is not one of the path factors. But it is present. When one aims, then one rubs against the object because the aim is accurate. And at that time, one becomes definite about what the object is. Knowledge arises, one knows. So at this, in this group, there's the factor of accurate aim, or sama sankapa, and the, and the factor of knowing, or samaditi. So these are the two factors that are part of the panya group of the path, the wisdom group. Therefore, because of our observation with the method of satipatthana, in every moment, of observation, there are five factors of the path arising. And this is called the five-limbed path to Nibbana. Sila is involved, although we are not in a situation where we're transgressing. We're not confronted with with situations where we're uh, going to have a chance to break our sila. But we have the intention to keep sila should the situation arise. So this is how sila is present. It's, it's present on the level of chitana, intention. So therefore, the three factors of the path that involve sila, the sila group, are present. And the samadhi group of three factors is also present. And the panya group, of the wisdom group of two factors, is also present. And this is the path to Nibbana. This path is to be developed, to be strengthened, to be enlarged. But at first, uh, it, this path occurs prior to the noble path. So therefore it is called the forerunner path, or Poba Bhaga uh, Maga. It is not the noble path yet, but the yogis are walking this path. So in the application of effort and aiming the mind, sati arises and the mind falls collectedly. And because of the collectedness of the aiming of the mind, the mind connects with the object, and there's knowledge. So the factors of effort, mindfulness, concentration, accurate aim, and panya, as well as the sila and a chetana level, these are all arising every second that one observes. So this is what one needs to develop. Every second of observation, the, this path occurs. And if one observes 60 times per minute, then that will be, if one observes every second, then this will be 60 times in a minute. And in, in, in one hour, it will be 3,600 times that this path occurs. So this is how one develops the path. One makes it, uh, one expands it, one strengthens it. Because they are observing every arising and path, every, every, the truth of suffering which arises within them, Because they observe this, the yogis know the truth of suffering. And this is being accomplished. But in fact, there are four things that happen. Four things are being accomplished at this moment. Because one observes and knows the truth of suffering in one's body, one dispels the truth of of its cause. So if we analyze also the moments that are, uh, the factors that are present as one observes in this forerunner path, the path, Poba Bhaga Maga, there are eight factors present. 
of this path. So the path, uh, at when in the moment of observation, the cycles of kilesas, of kama, of vipaka results, these are all coming to an end. These are all, are all ceasing. So, and the path is being developed each moment. So, as it is said, no dispel, realize, develop. These are the four functions of the path. So every time, every time one observes, one is knowing the truth of suffering, dispelling its cause, and realizing the cessation of these cycles of kilesas, kama, and, and vipaka, and they're developing the path to, to this realization, to this cessation. So this is four at a blow. And it is very valuable. One should just think about how valuable this, this is. So for yogis who practice with respect, meticulous care, and without taking breaks, they get this knowledge every moment of uh, observation. And people who are careless, they don't get this. They, they have a loss. And the less careful one is, the more careless one is, the more of a loss one will incur. So one shouldn't let oneself settle for a loss. So one should realize how valuable one moment of observation is and try to uh, and try to observe every moment because then at the end one will realize nibbana so now at the moment when whenever we know the arising whenever when we know every arising truth of suffering in our body with that knowledge, ignorance is being dispelled, and the and craving, which is the cause of suffering, is dispelled. We also have, uh, with that moment of knowing, there's momentary cessation, tadanga niroda, of kama of kilesas kama and results, and the forerunner path is being developed. So it is very valuable to be respectful, meticulous, and continuous in the practice because one gets this benefit. And if one is not respectful, meticulous, and careful, and continuous, then one won't get this benefit. So Sayadawji urges all the yogis uh, and hopes that by knowing how valuable each moment of application of the practice is, May you practice with respect, care, and continuity and get the benefits of the path.